Welcome back, friends. Welcome back. It's time for another episode, and we're actually not recording in like the middle of the night Woo-hoo! for once, um, because it's our anniversary week, and my mom has generously taken the kids, which means we get to uh, have a podcasting marathon, like they're romantic. Have free time like, during the day? Yeah, like the romantic people we are. We're like, oh, what should we do for our anniversary? Well, let's just podcast for like three days. <laughs> Movies. Ooh. Reading un- uninterrupted. Oh, yeah. Oh, talk dirty to me. Okay. So we're doing In the Flesh, Season 2, Episode 5. So this is actually the penultimate episode. Woo-hoo. We couldn't think of what to call it last time. Matt made one up, which I still think is made up. But um, All words are made up, honey. It's I'm 80% sure we can use it, which is the same as 100%. So it's fine. It's fine. So this was a, okay, we got a lot of Simon backstory. I was complaining about how Simon was a two-dimensional character and uh, the universe must have heard me because uh, we get all the Simon backstory this episode and it's uh, suitably tragic as I would have expected. And we also get some more Philip and Amy, Yay. which I am living for their plot line right now. Yep. I don't, all the rest of it is like, it's fine, it's good, it's entertaining. But every time I see P- Philip and Amy, I'm like, oh, oh, I'm happy to be back. But we start out and it's Simon in the city, the city, whatever, a big city. Yeah. So at first, Rachel thought, is this a flashback? I was like, huh, he looks like a he's wearing he's either he's wearing makeup or he's human. Is this a flashback? And it turns out no, he snuck away to the city to stay at this motel. Ah, uh, it's a it's a nice hotel. Is it a nice it's not, because you can hear like screaming and crying and Well, I mean the walls are thin, but I mean it's it's not just like a cheap roadside yeah, place where you get a room. It's, it's all right. A multi floored building with like decorated interiors. Yeah, well, he's at a um, rent-a-room place. Yes. Let's put it that way. And he meets um, another PDS sufferer who arrives with a duffel bag. And Simon's like, yeah, I've met the first Risen. There's just there's just something about him. He's he's beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I, I and kinda, he's like, okay, I well, the undead like prophet him. has... Has a message for you. Yeah. He's like, oh, you know, we're really proud of you. And he's like, is he proud of me, though? Is he proud of me? And he's like, yeah, 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 he's proud of you. It's fine. And so he puts on this DVD. And the DVD is like, hey, great. You found the first Risen. Now kill him. <laughs> you must sacrifice you must the sacrifice first him. Risen at the 12th hour of the 12th day of the 12th month. And I was like, wait, I have clarifying questions. Is that midnight or is that noon? Are you using when, a 24-hour clock yeah, or a 12-hour clock? When are we assuming that the day has started? Like, what is the 12th hour? Is it the 12th? Is it the day? So it's like the 12th hour after dawn? Is it... I, I need clarification, is what I'm saying. But he's just like, oh, no. Which the other PDS sufferer plays like a really, really bad guy in the British being human. And, oh, he does. Yeah, I and I was. It was very that. distracting for me because he plays like a pretty despicable character, and uh, he's a. It was like, oh, that guy, huh? Okay. Actually, several of the actors in this episode are also in Being Human. That guy is, and there's another guy later. Uh, so Simon has been tasked with killing Kieran. Oh no! Just sad. Because Kieran and Simon had just kind of, you know, and he was like, oh, I found the first Risen. Everything's going to be so much better and now. And I love him. And they're like, okay, now kill the person you love. Thanks. Shoot. To bring about the second rising, which like, God, come on. Why, why does everybody want, the, we haven't really talked about why everybody wants the second rising. I get it with Maxine. We're getting hints of what Maxine is wants because she's been to a grave and she's like not long now so clearly she's trying to get somebody risen somebody didn't rise the first time around and she's hoping they'll they'll get caught in the second census or whatever like they'll they'll come up the next time um but why do the current pds sufferers want a second rising so they'll outnumber the living maybe maybe because i mean they're we're in the thick of a lot of prejudice right now, and I feel like a whole nother batch of people waking up 
to uh, murder and pillage is maybe not the best way to encourage. Uh, Unless it's, what if it's different? What if it's not a repeat of the first rising? What if the second rising is a continuation of the first rising? Like the people who rose yeah. in the first rising became zombies, like undead. What if the undead now become living again? Maybe. Maybe that's what they mean by the second rising. Well, like, I, well, I'm just thinking of a like plot twist oh, alternative interpretation. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. But we're beginning to see that part of the narrative that the PDS sufferers have created for themselves is that they are better than human. Right. This is a hard sell for me. Um, I'm not saying they're worse than human, but here's the thing when you don't heal and you're immortal. Cumulatively over time, unless you are the most careful person in the history of forever, you're going to fall apart. Right? This has been covered in lots of different stories. I mean, you go home and you look down and you're like, oh, fuck, where'd my toe go? I literally don't remember losing my toe today. Well, that toe ain't coming back. I mean, it wouldn't come back if you were alive either. But <laughs> like if you were just like you cut yourself, right? Well, like in Pirates of the Caribbean, there's the one guy who has his knee tied together with rope. Yeah. And like over the course of the Pirates movies, they it, it becomes like a running gag that he has to like keep repairing Is this the his rope. eyeball guy? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, or like Elantris, right? Brandon Sanderson's yes. first book, his Elantris first standalone book, Elantris. They become they're supposed to become these like luminous exalted beings, but instead they become zombies basically. And literally they're driven insane. They don't repair from damage. Right. And they like never lose consciousness. Right. So the cumulative weight of the pain from all of their wounds. And even worse, the PDS sufferers don't feel anything. So they right. could have, they could injure themselves severely and they wouldn't know it. So you... Right, there are humans who yeah. have a disorder where they can't feel anything. Right. And they're like super prone to injuries. And they're super prone to, like, getting infections. Right, because you're not aware of it. Right. I mean, they can't get infections. Well, and you, but. you get wounded on, like, your back, and you never feel it, so it gets infected, and it goes septic. Right. I mean, they're not worried about infection, but still, just right. the cumulative effect of all of the damage you would take over time. Just accidents and things. You break your arm. That, ain't, that shit ain't coming back. Your arm's broke forever. You're going to have to figure out how to work with it. Actually, we talk about this on Torchwood, too. There's that one character by uh, Burn Gorman plays mm -hmm. that one character. And he dies. And they bring him back. But they don't bring him back. They bring him back as he's dead. He has no heartbeat. He's effectively. Right. Um, he's artificially reanimated. Artificially reanim reanimated. And, like, he cuts his hand. Well, that hand's never going to get healed. And he's also never going to die. So at a certain point, his body could become too damaged to function, but he'll still be conscious. That's fucking terrifying. But I guess we don't, that's not what we're focusing on. And I get it. But at the same time, it's like, it would be a hard sell for me to be like, hang on, you're trying to tell me that because I came back from the grave, I'm now an angel. All right. Well, um, I, lo I like cut my palm the other day and now I can't use my left hand and this shit's annoying. Well, Right, immortality. Reconcile that for me. Uh, immortality as a superior state, yeah, needs to be sustainable. Right, and this is not sustainable. But at the same time, oh, this is a coping mechanism, right? So coping mechanisms don't have to make sense. But back to the episode, uh, the guy, the guy that um, Simon meets. I don't know that we get his name. He goes downstairs, and when he walks down the stairs. Guess who's in the lobby? Fucking Gary. Fucking Gary's in the lobby. I don't... Ugh, 
Jesus, Gary. And so this guy like sets down his duffel bag because somebody is complaining to the management that they were told this would be a PDS say this would be a PDS free free accommodations. And they definitely saw a PDS sufferer and they want their money back. And this guy walks over and he's like, say it to my face. You want to say it to my face? And the guy's like, oh, no, 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 no problem. And leaves. Well, in the meantime, Gary snatched what he felt was important from this guy's duffel bag because fucking Gary. And yeah. And then we go back up to Simon and Simon is having a panic attack. He's hearing all of the sounds and he's just feeling overwhelmed. He ends up in like a fetal position in the corner because he was just told he has to kill the guy he's falling in love with. So he has all these conflicting interests. He has his dedication to the undead prophet and and he has his dedication for Kieran. Yeah, and then he gets a flashback. And this is much needed for Simon's character. I mean, we got a little bit of dimension last time, but this is exactly what we needed to flesh out Simon's character. Yeah. If we hadn't had all of these flashbacks and we just were like, oh, he doesn't want to kill Kieran because he likes him. I mean, it would have been still dramatic, but this adds a whole nother layer because it turns out Simon was one of the first PDS He was the sufferers. first person... First PDS sufferer to respond to the medication. Right. And so we get to see the two people that we actually previewed, foreshadowed, because this... Right, in the history lesson. If there's a a television show, College, where you go to school and there's like a a whole class called foreshadowing, they should just watch this because we put them way back when Jen was still going to school, which I kind of feel like she's not going to school anymore because she hasn't gone in a really long time. Um, But they're up and they're kind of in the background and they're the like inventors of neurotriptyline as a, as a way of treating the PDS sufferers. And I mentioned, I recognize that one guy. So we're probably going to meet them. Yeah. And here they are. And this is the guy who's also in being human. He's in being human, like season four. He's the guy that shows up. And cleans up like a crime scene. Yes, I did recognize him. Yeah. He's a very like um, natty fellow, very like put together. He's like, okay, gentlemen, we have 30 seconds. Let's get this clean. And he starts a time like a thing. And it's framed as sinister. So it's hard for me to, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, that guy. Because he's a really good guy to hate. He was the fucking Gary of that, of that, that season. Um, Mr. Sparrow or something. He has a very strange name in, um, in being human. Cause it turns out they serve like the devil who's at a rest home in Wales. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That That's, that's a tangent right there. But, um, yeah, they are administering medication to this PDS sufferer who it turns out is Simon. And they're like, oh, he's still not, nothing's happening. This isn't working. Like, how, why did we even think we would be able to treat these people? And then Simon's like, um, where am I? And they're like, oh, shit. It's working. We did it. And they're like, great. Perfect. This is great. And then we go back to modern times, real modern times. And it's a lady who is spreading PDS propaganda. She's giving out flyers that are like, one misdosed, and they'll be back to being rabid. Because the fallout from Fred's little stunt that he pulled trying to get Haley back is that everyone was reminded that the people living in and around them are one dose of medication away from being back to being rabid again. This has always been true, but it's, you know, you don't want to think about it. So now Fred has reminded everybody that that's the case. And Kieran is still... I mean, we had kind of a breakthrough in the last episode because he actually took his makeup and contacts off in front of a mirror. Right. And we're back to him covering the mirror and getting ready to put yeah, on. Yeah, so he's going through his daily ritual. Yeah, and he's getting ready to put on his makeup and his contacts and, and all of that. But then he's like, you know what, actually? Fuck it. Maybe not today. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to start being my authentic self because Kieran is growing As a character. And I think that's a lot of his decision to do that is to reciprocate to Simon. Because Simon did things Kieran's way. Yeah. And put on the makeup and the contacts and and spent the day with Kieran. 
And I think Kieran's like, okay, Simon did that for me. And, you know, we'll talk about it later, but yeah. I want to reciprocate and try to see things from his perspective. Yeah. But also I think it's Kieran realizing that he is catering to the wrong crowd. He is allowing his parents' denial to create a sense of um, revulsion for himself. Like he he is carrying the burden of their continued delusion. They yes. want to continue believing that he was different than all the other PDS sufferers. And he has been working so hard to maintain that illusion for them. And he's tired of it. And when it came to them working to protect him, they didn't. So what does he owe them now? Right. So he learns this episode how thin the their illusion is. is. Yeah. How yeah. thin their acceptance is. Right. Because when Gary was telling those stories at the at the Sunday lunch, they didn't stop him. But when Kieran tried to tell his story, they stopped him. And it was basically saying um, the human perspective is more valid. And so he has been allowing them to forget what he is. And that has he just realized that that was a mistake. And so he's he's not going to put that makeup back on because he no longer wants to shoulder the burden of making them feel comfortable. Because he is who he is, and it's time for them to confront that. But mean, in the meantime, his dad has been deeply affected by this flyer because his son just shattered the illusion that he didn't kill anyone by telling them i've killed people i wanted to kill people i was hungry you cannot imagine yeah. what it was like to feel driven like i like i felt driven when i came out of the grave and i remember it and his dad is not reacting well to that because he's like what if she's right what if he really is like one dose away from turning rabid and not to help this at all is when Kieran comes down with no makeup on. Right. And Jem's like, I can't be around him when he's like this. So we are back to what it was like when he first came home. We have very steadily backslid into a more deeper, entrenched sense of um, isolation and not hatred, but um, prejudice. And it is the steady work of people like Maxine and the community driving a wedge between the PDS sufferers and their families. And this is kind of a good, this is a good illustration of what bigotry does, what bigotry in politics, what bigotry in the media does. And it is, it is, it is a wedge. It drives a wedge between families, between community groups, between types of people. And it pushes people apart instead of bringing them together. And I mean, it's real life. This is what happens. This is what is happening right now between, um, you know, cisgendered heteronormative people and people in the LGBTQIA plus community is you know what unites you know what unites a political party better than anything? A common group to hate. And that's what happened in Nazi Germany. Yeah, when you start putting policies into place against the particular group, that spreads through the society as like, oh, here's this just little bit of bias on the like administrative side. Yeah. That transfers into the day-to-day -day society just that tiny bit of bias yeah. just accumulates over time right because it normalizes it yeah the human mind loves the hero villain narrative and in the absence of a villain they will take any that are provided for them and so instead of do you think about at the beginning of the pandemic how united everybody felt because our villain our the bad guy was the disease right, itself. The us versus them became humans versus the virus. The virus. And so 
we all came together over that. And then as soon as we had, like, the mask mandates, what the fuck happened? It was like basic human courtesy just went out the window. Like, I'm not asking you to saw off an arm. I'm asking you to wear a mask. Are you, are you fucking kidding me right it now? Because could save somebody's life. Yeah. Are you fucking kidding me right now? Literally, you could save a life by simply wearing a mask, and it became this thing that it didn't need to become. And you know why? It was because people in power, people in positions of political authority allowed it to become that because it created a rabid, radicalized. It was a source of cheap conflict. Yes, it was a source of cheap conflict, and it created a rabid, radicalized fan base for the types of people that wanted to stay in power and had absolutely no regard for what the effect of their policies were. Right. And that's basically what Maxine is doing. And that, that's she's, exactly. She's facilitating yes. all of this political pressure for her personal political agenda. Right. Which may not be like her political career progressing. She has some other goal to do with the PDS community we're not sure exactly what her end goal is but she's using her political position to manipulate the community right and it may not be specifically to drive a wedge to do something to the pds community it's she's manipulating them in this way to achieve her goal and it's almost a side effect of that that the exclusion and uh, what's the word? The persecution of the PDS subgroup yeah. is like a side effect. Yeah. But not an undesirable side effect. Not an undesirable. Right. It's an from, acceptable from Maxine's side effect. Point of view. Yeah. Um, and to further drive home the point of how far the gulf between Kieran and his family has been quietly widening as the effect of Maxine's work has been infecting everyone like a infectious disease is they show up and arrest Kieran for breaking into the doctor's office. Remember last se last episode where um, Zoe broke into the doctor's office? Well, Kieran takes the fall for that and they come in to arrest him and his dad does nothing. And his mom does nothing. And Jem does nothing. No one stands up for him. They just let him take him. And once again, politicians are not part of the executive branch. They're not part of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, I think. So I had said before that police were part of the judicial branch, but it's the executive branch. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's a separation of responsibilities As there between be. the people who write the laws and the people who enforce the laws. Right, because politics shouldn't reason. politics shouldn't play a part in who's innocent and who is guilty. This should be a factual discussion, not a political discussion. Right. And there's no facts here, but nobody gives a shit because they just have found the person they want to be the bad guy and they just want him to be the bad guy and they have no further interest in any kind of a discussion about that because they take him to a court room. But it's quite the sham. But we're not quite there yet because Philip. we're back to Philip. Right in the middle of this, oh, my fucking God, are they really going to let them – are they really going to let Kieran get taken like this again? They don't know what could happen to him. It was not even a year ago that um, PDS sufferers were being killed in the street out in front of their house. And now they're letting these people come and take their son away? Are you fucking serious? And then Philip. <laughs> <laughs> because philip wakes up alone and he's like oh which hey if i was amy i also would not stay in his approximately 18 inch wide bed right <laughs> that's a big ask okay i mean matt and i have a queen size bed and we more or less sleep in a twin size area of that queen size bed but i need to know that if i want to spread out the option is there okay um but then we go to Amy, too. So we're kind of cutting between Philip and Amy. And Amy is trying to do her own meds, and they hurt. And then she finds the flyer about the people with PDS can go rabid within one hour of a missed dose. 
And it kind of makes for a sad morning for Amy because I think she's beginning to suspect that something is wrong. I mean, she knows that something is wrong, because but I think it sa- might be shaking. She's yeah. She ends up having a seizure. And we know from the very first episode that there are some people who do not respond well to the medication or who eventually do not respond to the medication. So we are aware that there is a possibility that she could become something could be happening. Her body could be adapting to like building up a tolerance. Yeah, building up a tolerance for it. And it's just kind of sad. There's sad music playing. She just realized that Simon doesn't love her. Um, she banged Philip, who she previously hated. Um, but I don't think it was a um, like a revenge one night stand. I think it was more like a. Um, it was super hot that you stood up for people with PDS, and I kind of have liked you, but I didn't want to like you because I thought you were a dick. And now that I don't think you're a dick, maybe we should give this a shot. But it's still a little bit sad. And then we see Maxine. And Maxine is in a phone booth, which I love how nobody has a cell phone. Nobody has a cell phone, which is a very interesting choice. Which uh, I was thinking about this, where we have no idea what is happening in the outside world. Yeah. I think you mentioned it. In a previous yeah. discussion. Last one, last episode, yeah. Okay. And that's kind of part of the part of the narrative. I think yeah. that's why it was so uh jarring to see Simon staring out the window and seeing like a highway with yeah. lots of cars driving. Yeah. Uh it makes it feel very insular and intimate. And I think if we had introduced cell phones, also this is effectively like a recovering post-apocalyptic society. Because Right, they may not have actually developed cell phones or like smartphones. Yeah, I mean because it happened in 2009, the iPhone came out in 2008, but it could have effectively stopped development. And if enough infrastructure was destroyed or enough people People who would be responsible for maintaining the infrastructure or developing the infrastructure had been killed. Especially in rural areas. Right. And we don't know if this happened all around the world. And we don't know what the effect was all around the world. Because we're dealing with, I mean, we're talking about a small town on a small island in a fairly small country. As opposed to someplace like India Where can you imagine the number of dead who would have risen? Or, you know, you have cultures that are more, um, cream like they cremate their dead more often. Well, they're not going to be as affected as heavily as the people who tend to bury their dead. I mean, there's a lot of nuance here that we're not getting, which is fine. It's fine. It makes it feel um, very specific, and that's okay. I think that works better for the tone, and I think not having cell phones is key to that. Um, but she's making a phone call at a phone booth, and whoever she's talking to um, yells at her. She's like, I'm trying, I'm working, I'm doing it. Like, get up off my back for a minute about it. And then she comes back in, and the B&B lady sees that she's upset. And she tells the B&B lady that she was talking to her dad, but last episode she got a message from the head of Victus. So I have a feeling it was more like she was talking to whoever it is that sent her there. Right. Possibly the head of Victus. And she mentions to the B&B lady that she has a younger brother. She she says she has a brother. Yeah. Uh, Sandra says, oh, older or younger? And Maxine kind of hesitates. And says and younger. And says younger. And she also had that train. Remember the train that she had in her luggage in the very first mm-hmm. or second episode? And we wondered what that might be. So I don't know. We're getting some more breadcrumbs about Maxine. Maybe next episode will be Maxine's episode. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then we go back to Kieran's um, sham of a court appearance. because it's Which, the... once again, he's in front of the like town council. Right. Which is a legislative body, which is not, should not be it's not in a position It's not even really the town council. Because, well, I got Philip got kicked off, but it's the... Um, it's the lady who runs the bar. It's the lady who was filming people going into the brothel and then another guy. And they have like tea and biscuits. And they're right. like, all right, so go ahead and confess. And he's like, uh, confess to what? 
And they're like, confess, you broke in, you did it, you confess, and maybe we won't send you back to Norfolk. And he's like, are you threatening to send me back to the treatment facility? And they're like, um, we can do it. Literally in this brochure, it says, if we suspect at all that you are working against the goals of the community, we can send you back. And he's like, right. Anyone I'm, suspected I'm not a threat to the community. following their like release yeah. uh, procedure, release guidelines, um, is to be reported. And anyone that is perceived as a threat has to go back. Right. And he's like, I'm not a threat to the community. And she goes, are you the community? And he goes, oh, am I, I'm sorry, what? And she goes, are you the community? And he's like, well, I guess, no, I'm not. And she's like, yeah, you're not. You're not the community. That's right. That's right. Uh, and the PDS laws give us the right to do basically anything we want to you. So why don't you just go ahead and confess? So they give him a tape recorder and they're like, okay, go ahead and confess. And he's like, I didn't do it. And then he just throws the tape recorder down and they're like, oh, how monstrous. As if the most monstrous thing happening here isn't the um, witch trial that's currently occurring. Right. Yeah. And then we get some more Simon flashback because Simon is still in his hotel room kind of having a crisis of faith. And they ask him, he's like chained to a wall and they're like, can we keep experimenting on you? And, and he's, he's like, like yeah, um, uh, um, will it cure me eventually? And they're like, mm, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. And he's like, well, I guess like, okay then. And it turns out what they mean was, can we keep torturing you? Because then immediately we see him strapped to a rack and they're going to electrocute him to try to right. stimulate they have, his like, brain. probes in his brain. Yeah. Which again, he can't heal from that shit. Every hole you put in his head is a permanent hole in his head. But they're going to try to shock him directly to stimulate his brain. And so they're shocking him with really high amounts of electricity. And then they, for some reason they can't turn it off and the entire facility goes dark. And then we, there's like a red light comes on and from the speaker, we hear the undead prophet. And so here I'm, I'm making a call that Simon is the undead prophet and we have a whole fight club yeah, dynamic a, here. A Tyler Durden situation. Yes. Yeah. Where the, the electroshock therapy like gave him a split personality, whatever, where he's the undead prophet. And that's why he's wearing a mask. Uh, the video of the undead prophet sounded kind of like Simon accent wise. Mm -hmm. And at, at least uh, that's what I'm telling myself. Okay. So <laughs> that's, that's my prediction. Yeah. Either Simon created a split personality because of the like, horrors of the treatment that he underwent which is an and the fact that he was like depressive like s horrifically depressive before he died or or the mystery has deepened and yeah. maybe the undead prophet is something different some something related to the reason they rose in the first place either way um this is our first like oh this is how simon got recruited they literally talked directly to him and then he goes back, he gets chained back to a wall, and our friend from the um, motel is there, the guy that brought him the video. And he's like, yeah, you know how um, how the living say that they're driven by philosophy and morality and love and yeah, the, whatever? The second in command of Under the Undead Prophet yeah. is Simon's cellmate from the like lab right where well and he's like his treatment. he's like what are the what are the living really they're just desperate to keep surviving like right. that's all they are they live desperate little lives trying to survive as long as they can and we're free from all that we don't have to we don't have to worry about it anymore we get to we get to actually live for philosophy and life and love and all that stuff because we're not just trying to survive we already died we already punched our ticket and now we're back and we're back for good so we get to do whatever we want. And then we cut back to Amy because poor Amy, this is her house. This is her grandmother's house. And these people are squatting here now because they feel like Simon has uh, made them entitled to Amy's place. And right. she's like, don't touch that. This is my stuff. And they're like, I'll touch whatever I want, which I'd be like, all right, out, out, out. 
I don't like people touching my stuff. But Amy is like about to say something, I think. And then she gets a nosebleed and she faints. And then they're like, are you, are you okay? They get her in her room. She wakes up and she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I really tied one on last night. I, I had some sheep's brains to take the edge off and just feeling a little hungover. And they're like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, totally okay, reasonable fine. explanation. That's fine. And like, poor Amy, because then she starts crying. And she's really kind of alone in this because she's not sure who she can tell. I mean, who can you tell? She's been trying to get help from the doctor. I mean, to her credit, she's been going to everywhere that she thinks that can help her. She went to the doctor. She went to the nurse. She's trying the new neurotriptyline, and it's not working. And then Kieran heads home and from his court appearance, and there is a protest going on outside his house. And his dad's like, oh, well, how did it go? And he's like, well, they want me to confess to something I didn't do. And he's like, now, now, Kieran, you did it. We all know you did it. I, It's okay. We know Simon is an influence. We know this has happened before. To them, this feels like a repeat of when he fell in love with Rick. Rick. And then all of a sudden, his behavior changed. Except that's not what's happening this time, but they can't see it. And so they're like, well, why don't you just sign the confession? Just just sign the confession and then this will all be over. And he's like, I'm not confessing to something I didn't do. And his dad uses a line, go along to get along. Yeah. 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 And Kieran's comply, like. Comply with these unreasonable demands. Just. Just to keep the peace. Just to keep the peace. Right. And Kieran is literally like. You guys are supposed to be my family. You are supposed to have my back no matter what. What the fuck is happening? Do you realize how hard I have been working for you? Do you know the emotional cost I have paid? The toll I have paid to try to maintain your delusions? And then the first time there's a conflict, you can't fucking handle it? Like, I'm tired of this. And he leaves. And then we go back to Philip. And Philip has disassembled the toaster because it's Philip versus the toaster. Yeah. And then Amy shows up at the door and she's like, hey, how, how's it going? What, what you up to? And he's like, oh, you know, a little DIY. And she's like, oh, yeah, it's great. So I'm going on a day trip. You want to go on a day trip? And he's like, uh, what about the travel ban? She's like, it's not like I'm going to Timbuktu. And so he says, well, where are we going? And she goes, somewhere crazy. crazy. Which it turns out is... um. What they call crazy golf, or in the United States, more commonly referred to as putt putt, which putt putt's actually the uh, franchise name, like Kleenex. Gotcha. Um, it's mini, mini golf. golf. Yeah. yeah. So they go to a mini golf place, an abandoned one. There's like leaves and stuff all over. It's either abandoned or seasonal. And right now it's winter time, so it's closed. Right. And this whole scene is so fucking adorable i can't even with them it's so cute because it turns out he uh, uh, <coughs> philip has never done crazy golf before and he's good at it but he's really good at it and so they have this whole debate about whether or not it's a proper sport which this is literally straight out of rachel and matt's playbook <laughs> do you think this is in the olympics absolutely this is not in the olympics and then amy's like um Ping pong is in the Olympics. They just call it table tennis. And so Philip makes up a like elaborate name for mini golf. Yeah, uh, a more formal name. Yeah. And he's like, if, if we could call it that, then it'd Maybe be in the Olympics. Maybe they'll recognize it. Yeah. And then I could compete in the Olympics. And she's like, oh, yeah, then it would be a proper sport. And then oh, she's who, Like, shaking. who cares about what the gods of Olympus say? Right. And they're there to... Um, for a distraction. Amy wants a distraction. And, but her hands start shaking. And so Philip's like, oh, are you cold? And she's like, I actually can't feel anything. Not even the cold. Like, she pinches his cheek. And she's like, do you feel that? And he goes, yeah. And she goes, I don't. So she p pinches her own cheek. And she's like, I don't feel that. I don't feel anything. Which leads me to question. what What is sex doing for Amy? Maybe there's some things they feel. Oh, maybe intense enough. Yeah. Um, I read a vampire book. It's like a steampunk vampire book. Um, the Grey Friar series by Clay and Susan Griffin, Griffiths and the main character, one of the main characters is a vampire and all of their senses are heightened except touch and so the reason that they can like 
do things. Like the reason they can be stronger and they can take more damage is like it literally takes like an exceptional amount of sensation for them to be able to feel it. So maybe that's it. Like maybe, maybe something like sex would be something you could feel, but like a light touch on your cheek is not within right. the realm of like what you can, what you can sense. Um, I mean, that would, that would make more sense because clearly it's something that she uses as a release. Um, so it wouldn't make sense if it's not doing anything. That would just be right. furtherly, furtherly depressive would be my, <laughs> what I would say for that. Um, and, but this kind of reminded her she was here for a distraction and now she's been reminded. Right. And so she whacks her ball off into the bushes. And, and this leads into a discussion that is very allegorical. Yeah, if they're if they're showing this television show in the foreshadowing classroom, they also need to show this in the when characters are talking about something that seems trivial, but they are making statements that relate to the overall theme. That's what that's what this is because Amy's like. Um, the point of the game is to keep on playing because she tells him, don't finish, don't, because this is the 18th oh, yeah. hole. If, if you finish, it'll be over. The game will be over. And he's like, well, don't we want the game to be over? And she goes, no, the point of the game is to keep on playing. And Philip says, but if we don't finish it, it all becomes pointless, doesn't it? Sideline metaphysical discussion. Woo. Drop the mic, Philip. If there is no death, what is the point of life? Yep. Oh, well. Amy is like, I, I hear what you're saying, but uh, let's go back to the distraction part. So she puts the ball right by the hole, and she's like, if you get a hole in one, you get to kiss the loser. And so he goes over with his little putt-putt thing, and he's like, focus, Philip, focus. <laughs> and, and then he tries he to hit it, and it does not enough. go in. And Amy kisses him anyway, and the little smile. Well, he says, I wanted it too much. Yeah. <laughs> Aww, and the little smile after Amy yeah. kisses him, I was like, all right. I want this entire show, and I want it to end happy. I want the Philip and Amy show, and I want them to get together in the end. I know that's not going to happen. I 100% know that's not going to I 150% know that's not going to happen, but I just want that to happen so bad. And then we go back to fucking Gary. Like, what a letdown. Jesus. Uh. We went from the cute little Philip Amy thing to fucking Gary because this is where we learn that he stole the DVD and the notebook from Simon's friend because he gives it to Maxine and she's like did you watch any of this and he's like no no sir no because chain of command and all that like, shut up Gary you're not in the military you're not Gary. in the military Gary you're being used by Maxine and you're letting yourself be used because it makes you feel masculine so just shut up and he's like listen if you want me to kill Simon, I mean, I'll do it. I'll do it right now. You just say the word and I'll go kill Simon. And you know Gary hates Simon because Simon bested Gary in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it has effectively, every time he sees Simon, it must be a reminder of the fact that no matter how badass he thinks he is, Simon got him. And he got him good and he got him right away and it wasn't even a real fight. And so Gary hates Simon. And... To make it even worse, Simon didn't gloat. Right. Because Simon is um, like actually, actually competent. And Gary has a fragile male ego that is wounded by any touch of perceived weakness. It's not like, oh, dude, you did great. Can you show me how you did that? It's like, oh, no. Or even like, wow, he he beat me. I respect him. I respect that. It's more like, oh, he revealed to me my own fragility. And the only way I can recover from this is to defeat him back. Even yeah. Even worse. Right. I saw an interesting um, video. It's on Instagram. Sometimes I get these recommended videos. But this one was a woman and she was like, how do you know you don't have brothers when your dad's trying to take the engine out of a car and he calls you over to help him? And you're wearing a dress. And so she like shows herself wearing a dress or whatever. And so then she had a stitch where she she attached an extra video to her own video. And she was like, listen, y'all, the number of men losing their shit over a video of me talking about taking the engine out of a car is too damn high. She's like, yeah, of course, my hands weren't dirty. I just arrived there. No, I wasn't going to wear the dress crawling around on the inside. I was going to change before I did it. Can you all fucking calm down? She was like, why are men so fragile? They can't even handle seeing a picture of a woman next to an engine. That's fucking Gary. 
Yeah. Gary would be like, "Mm mm-mm. The only reason he respects Jem is because he wants to get Jem. She is a thing to be acquired. And he is doing what is necessary to acquire her. And once he solidly has her under his, in his pocket, all that will go away. Right. There's the whole, like, uh, sexual conquest angle. But then there's also the, like, tomboy angle of I can justify spending time with a person with boobs. Yeah. Because. I want them boobs. Because, no, well, oh. there's that. Oh, there's okay, the sexual yeah. conquest angle. But there's yeah. also, in Jem's case, she does the same kinds of things and she's good at it. Yeah. So it's, I can justify spending time with her. Uh, that's not. Uh, it I, comes I, off as, in, like, patronizing or infantilizing. Like, isn't it cute? She thinks she can do all the stuff that I can do. And well, no, she's but she actually good does. Yeah. Right. And I think he can justify spending time with her because she's actually, like, a worthwhile comrade in the fight. Yeah. Right? And she has demonstrated that. She has a list of deeds that she has performed as a member of this you know, group, whatever, um, you know, she's fought them off with resourcefully, whatever. But then there's the whole sexual conquest angle, too. Yeah. So that makes her very attractive Attract- to An Gary. attractive package, yeah. And then we get some more Simon flashback. And Simon is remembering um, having to see his family while he was still undead because John, one of the doctors, had promised him that he would not, his family wouldn't see him like this. That his family wouldn't see him until he was completely cured. And John's like, mm-hmm, yeah, I know I said that, but whatever. Okay, so time to go see your dad. And so they give him the makeup and the contacts to put on. And he's not good at the makeup. I right. love these tiny little attention to detail elements that they put in. Like, he didn't put the makeup on very good. Maybe the makeup wasn't good yet. Like, right. maybe they hadn't developed a better yeah, makeup Yeah, like it yet. wasn't on his lips or anything. Right. Yeah. And he looks, like, streaky and weird. He looks like... Um, a corpse with makeup on yeah. and I love it love these tiny little touches and this is him seeing his dad but we're also seeing John and the other scientist talking to a politician and they're working out very believably working out the partially deceased syndrome acronym is they're like I don't know they're really like partially living but partially deceased or partially dead and the guy's like, oh, yeah, dead doesn't sound like a good word. And he's like, mm, how about deceased? And the other guy's like, you know, it's it's a, it's a set of symptoms, which if I had to be pressed, I would say was like a syndrome. And so they're like, oh, partially deceased syndrome. All right. And then in the meantime, Simon's talking to his dad. And he's like, hey, so where's mom? And his dad won't answer. And his dad's like, do you really not remember? And Simon's like, remember what? And then his dad is like, you came home. Simon says, when? When did I come home? And then his dad's like, I can't do this. I just can't do this. So his dad gets up and leaves. He gets up and leaves. And Simon stands up and shouts after him, like, what happened to mom? And they end up tasing him and dragging him away. And this is when we hear from John that Simon murdered his own mother. Yeah. He came back home as a untreated PDS sufferer and murdered his own mother. And he doesn't know it because he doesn't remember. And then we go back to Kieran, and Kieran is looking at a picture that he drew of Simon. And I have to admit, I had literally forgotten Kieran was an artist. (laughs) Like, I forgot that was part of the plot, because we have not been exploring that at all. And it got me thinking, would that not have been an interesting thing to include? Would be like Kieran painting or creating artwork? Right, as part of his, like, working through it? Yeah, like, about what it was like for him to have risen. That would have been a really cool angle is we get kind of like, well, he sketches, he paints or whatever, but we don't get like, this is how he processes things. And I think it would have driven home better that he was an artist and someone who needed to create art as part of like their, the living their best life would have been to have him create artwork as a way of processing himself. And it would add depth to the character without resorting to an inner monologue. Right, it really would have. And I I wish we had used it better or more. I mean, it's fine. This whole I'm I'm 
I'm not dissatisfied with this show at all, but I literally had forgotten he was an artist because it has played so little of a role in except that he was going to go to Paris. Like that was it. And then we've right. all kind of forgotten he was going to go to Paris. So, I mean, it's only been like three episodes, but so much has fucking happened. And he ends up sneaking out because Dean's an idiot, right? Dean's an idiot. So he just walks out the front door and leaves. And Dean... Oh, he walks out the back door. Okay, fine. Because Dean is standing in front of the house, only looking towards the road. Right. Like, you're supposed to be watching Kieran. You should be looking towards the house, at least. Is it that he's an idiot, or are they just becoming complacent about their own power over this population? Right. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a lot of, oh, Kieran, he's never been a problem. He always follows the rules. Right. We told him to stay in the house. He'll stay He's going to stay in the it's house. It's fine. And yeah. he actually goes to Amy's to try to find Simon. But Simon is still at the hotel, still having his nightmare flashbacks. And this is where we find out why his spine is open. Because we've seen the long cut down his spine. Right. And previously. nobody else has that. And they've literally opened up his spine and are, like, inspecting it. And he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. And they don't respond to him. And he's like, can you guys hear me? I don't want to do this anymore. But at this point, he ceased to become a person. To the, he ceased being a person to them. Right. If he ever was to begin with. And so they already have his cooperation. They don't need to continue to pretend like they like him. And it's sad and, like, really tragic. And Kieran finds some blue of it, blue oblivion in Simon's drawer. And he pockets it right as Amy comes in. And this is another sweet moment because Amy and Kieran's relationship um, is at a crossroads. Because Kieran is um, clearly in love with the woman that, or the man that Amy was in love with. Or thought she was in love with. And so they do a good job of conveying that all is forgiven without having to have an explicit conversation. Because Amy just says, does he like your new look? Because Kieran's not wearing makeup. And Kieran's like, about Simon, Amy. I'm, and she's like, nope. All right. It's okay. I get it. It's she's fine. already moved on. She's moved on. She's somebody. like, you're my best dead friend forever. It's okay. She just had a sweet date. That's got to help. Yeah. Right. And Simon, then we go back. Okay. Back to Simon. We're getting Simon's backstory in flashes. And now we see where Simon gets sent home with his dad. He gets his belongings in a bag and he gets sent home and he tries to eat dinner with his dad. He goes back up to his old bedroom where he has a picture of his mom and him on the on the bedside table, which is the picture that he he has with him at Amy's house. That's on her vanity. And ultimately, his dad can't handle it. His dad cannot handle having the man who killed his wife, even if it's his own son in his house. Yeah, and here we see another couple nice little details. Like, he there's makeup on his pillow. Yeah. And you can see his arm. He's wearing a short sleeve shirt. And he, like, it's, you know, dead skin from the shoulder down to about the middle of his forearm. And then it's, like, human skin. Right. So, like, he only put makeup on his hand and, like, a few inches up his wrist. Up to the, his sleeve. Yeah. yeah. Where his sleeve would have and covered up. And since he's wearing a different length sleeve shirt, you can see the gap. Yeah. Yeah. And that was just nice touch. Phenomenal. Like, the attention to detail in this show. And I kind of feel for everybody in this situation. Because you have to imagine if Simon was a long-term drug user. He, if he was someone who suffered from substance abuse disorder during his lifetime there could be a lot of complicated emotions between him and his family to start with right his father may have already like disowned him yeah we don't know what their life looked like while simon was alive and oftentimes in situations where someone in the family has substance abuse disorder, there is a lot of complicated stuff that happens. And then for him to have died of an overdose and then to come back and kill his mother, it has, it may feel like one long betrayal to the dad, just depending on what their life was like and the way they treated him when he had his substance abuse disorder before he had his partially deceased syndrome. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot here and we don't get into it, which is fine 
because this is heavy enough that he gets kicked out. And then we have some more time with Kieran because Kieran comes down and his parents have not let it go. Like, where were you? Because he was out and he came back where he snuck out around Dean. And they're like, how can we trust you if you're sneaking around? He was like, I was trying to find Simon. I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this. And they're like, get out of what, Kieran? You need to stop lying. We can't trust you when we you, can't trust you when you're now like that this. you're behaving like this again. Yeah. And he's like behaving like what? Like an empowered sovereign individual. So fucking sorry, family. And the dad's like, well, I don't even know. I don't know what to do with you. And he's like, well, you could start by not siding with the mob, dad. Maybe you could try doing that. And then we cut to Amy, and Amy is in a tent in a field, which I love how dramatic Amy is. <laughs> She's I so extra. Just love it. Well, first of all, her her fam- her house has been taken over, so she can't really do this at home. She can't really bring Phil up there, but she just has, like, a pup tent, and she's hanging out in this field, and it's raining, and she's writing out her last will and testament, because remember, from the first season, she had a very thorough will the first time around, too. Right, because she had a terminal disease. Right. And so she has this will that she has written out to Kieran, and she signs the envelope, Kieran Walker, and just about that time, Philip arrives. We see it. Well, we see a silhouette, and we hear squish, squish. Yeah, because it's pouring down rain. And, and we're like, oh, no. Is who it could it be? A rabid. No, it's Philip. No. And so Philip comes in. I got your message. And she's like, hey, Philip. I'm so glad you're here. Um, Now, I'm not going to be mad, no matter what you say, so I just want you to tell me the truth, but... During the rising, did you ever kill um, a rabid? And Philip's like, I'm more of a back office kind of guy. <laughs> I was believable. Uh, yeah, I was um, sharpening pencils. I wasn't like I wasn't out shooting people. And she's like, No, no, it's okay, Philip. I, I won't be angry. You can just tell me. And he's like, No, no, I never killed anybody. Of course, I didn't kill anybody. And she's like, okay, well, it would have been better if you had, but that's fine. And so she pulls out these fluffy pink handcuffs. And she's like, here, Philip. Mixed signals. <laughs> she's like, here, Philip, can you please put these on? And this is a dramatic moment. We are leading up to something pretty dramatic. But in typical Amy fashion, it's all conflicting. Right. It's- she can't outright say, I need you to kill me. She can't. She's like leading him on. Yeah. She uh, trying to get him to get the point. She uses, uh, anyway, she uses like complicated emotion. She uses humor and levity as a way of conveying seriousness. And so having pink fluffy handcuffs in this moment is very on brand. Yeah. And she has him handcuff her behind her back. And she's like, okay, Philip, so here's the sitch. I'm becoming immune. Oh, she tells him, I'm at Terminal 5, the train's ready to leave the station, and I just need to get on board. You savvy? And he's like, I'm sorry, what? And she's like, God, you don't get my metaphors, but that's fine. I'm becoming immune to the medication. I think I'm going to go rabid soon, and once I go rabid, that'll be it. I'll never be able to come back because the medication doesn't work, and I don't want to live that way. It's no way to live. It's a fate worse than death. It's a fate worse than death. So I need you to drive the screwdriver through my head, okay? Before that happens. Before that happens. And Philip is like, what? Because his dream has come true. He's with Amy. Right. And then Amy is like, great. Love you, Philip. Could you please kill me? And to his credit, Philip is like, okay. I mean, okay. Like, if that's what you, if that's what you, we need to do. And then we get to go back to the B&B. Because Maxine is like staring at all these photos and she's like, somebody please just send me a sign. And the B&B lady knocks on the door and she's like, do you want to come to the finale? God, I love the double speak in this show. Do you want to come to the finale? Like the episode, yeah. you know, we're, we're getting yeah, ready the, to end. The season. Yeah. yeah. And she's like, oh, um, yeah, I guess. Because the hard graft show, the detective show where everybody's a suspect is finally wrapping up. But it actually wrapped up the night before. But, but Sandra didn't get to watch it. Yeah, the night Sandra before. didn't get to watch it. So it's been recorded. So they're all there. They have champagne. She gives champagne to Maxine. She pours herself a glass. She gives one to her husband. And then the mother in law is like, Excuse me, rude. And she's like, It goes right through you, and I'm going to have to clean it up. And tonight is my night. And so she turns it on, and the mother in law goes, <laughs> The mother in law okay, goes, Okay, so before, before the mother in law, oh, okay. before you quote her. Yeah. 
when you just said the do you want to see the finale as double speak now i'm thinking is the mother-in-law going to give like a metaphorical explanation for the show like foreshadowing oh yeah the detective's the bad guy isn't it it's the detective's dad yeah is the bad guy i think yeah and you know, she tells her the whole plot of the final episode she just spills the beans she's like well let me tell you because the lady's like i locked myself in the room all day because i didn't want to risk anybody spoiling it for me and so the mother-in-law's like oh i saw it last night here this guy's the bad guy right after <laughs> after sandra was like this is my night and that means nothing for you yeah the mother-in-law's like well, fuck you then. Yeah, here we go. I love the mother-in-law. I laughed out loud. I laughed out loud. Because Sandra, the B&B lady, is like, oh, you bitch. <laughs> and so the mother-in-law's like, guilty as charged. I don't give a shit. And she's like, when I saw you crawling your way out of that grave, I knew. And what Maxine's like, hold, hold on. You saw the rising? And she's like, oh, yeah, I and was in the, the back. here's the sign that Maxine just asked yeah. for. And Sandra's like, yeah, I was in the back of the car with Jimmy. And I was, you know, getting it on with Jimmy. And her husband is like, can we not talk about Jimmy? We're not to we say his name We do not say this, this house. that name in this house. And she's like, Jimmy, Jim, 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 Jim. She was like, he gave me pleasure, sexual pleasure beyond your imagination. And what did you give me? A failing B&B &B and a mother-in-law who won't fucking die. <laughs> Hmm. And Maxine's Does this like, person resent their situation? Uh, maybe a little. And Maxine's like, wait, okay, hold on. Pause, 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 pause the vitriol for a minute. You saw the rising? And she's like, yeah, I saw the whole thing. And Maxine's like, ding, 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 score. Score. And then we go back to Philip and Amy because shit's getting serious. Philip's got the, he's got the screwdriver up in the air. He's getting ready to stab Amy. Amy looks up at the sky one last time. And rain falls on her face, and she feels it. And she's she like, she can feel it on her she's face. She's like, Philip, wait, my face, my face is, is wet. wet. My face is wet. And he's like, well, yeah, oh, I yeah. told you about the hole in the tent. Yeah, because what does she say? Oh, it's a small matter in the grand scheme of yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> the hole in the tent. And she's like, no, no, you don't understand. I can feel it. I can feel it. My face is wet. My face is wet. And right, he's and like, she realizes I'm not becoming resistant to the medication. Something else I'm is happening. I'm going through some other kind of development. Right. And uh, Philip is like, do you, do you still want me to, to do it? And she's like, no. Of course not, no, dummy. No, dum dum. I don't want you to kill me now. <laughs> and then we go back to the Walker household, which is falling apart. Because everyone has been burying resentment and not discussing it and not believing each other and just absolute shit show, they are all falling apart. Gary is waiting outside for Jem. Maybe. Maybe for Jem. We don't know. Is Gary watching Kieran's window or yeah. is he watching Jem's window? He could have taken over for Dean. He could, he could be have. just doing okay. the house watch. Yeah, because we don't. Yeah. we know that Kieran and Jem are both like up and moving around their rooms. Yeah, and from Gary's perspective, all we see is a curtained window with a silhouette moving behind it. Right, and like any kind of divisive politics, it forces sides to make a choice, even if the choice is artificial. So Kieran does not need to choose between whether or not he will be part of the PDS community or part of his family. But because his family has fallen prey to these divisive politics, he has to choose. And the way we are we are showing this choice is the document he brought home that he needs to sign, the confession that they gave him that he's supposed to sign. And he almost signs it. But in the end, he doesn't because he doesn't want to choose a life where he's lying to himself anymore. He's already done that. He's already done and that. And he knows what the outcome is. Right. And now he has someone. He has Simon. And Simon accepts him for exactly who he is. And why would he settle for anything and less? And encourages him to be even more who he is. Right. And so he tears it up. He tears it up. 
And then we go back to the Sandra, the B&B lady, and we see the Maxine and Sandra's face from the perspective of the pictures. So like we're looking the, at the them. board with all the photos. So of we the don't risen. we don't know who she points at, but the B&B lady points at somebody as having been the first risen. And Maxine's like, are you sure? She goes, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm sure. I was banging this dude. Didn't we hear? That's the first one that came up. Yep. And then we get a little bit more Simon backstory. We got to wrap up his backstory. We got to figure out how yep. he got in with, how he became the 12th apostle of the undead prophet. And he's all alone. He's all alone hanging He's out. in an underpass tunnel. Yeah. He's walking through a park. Yeah. And the only thing we needed was the soft piano music from the end of The Incredible Hulk while he's walking off down the oh, yeah. road. Yeah. Totally. And he ends up calling the phone number that he found in with his stuff. When he got his stuff back in the bag, there was a slip of paper with a phone number on it. And he calls that phone number. Which I bet Simon wrote it. Maybe. We don't know. In, we don't know. In his altered state. But he heads to the safe house and... Because he gets the information for it and from the phone call. And he um, finds his treatment center buddy there. And he also finds acceptance. And a very, very last supper moment where he walks through the door and there's this long table and all these PDS people are on the other side. And I think it's an almost exact recreation of the last supper. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Which would make sense because those are the 12 disciples. And they all are. they all come around and hug him. And... Um, tell him he's accepted and he's welcome here. And that's exactly what he needed to hear. And so you can kind of understand Simon's religious devotion to this family, this found right, because family. Because it's the first supportive group that he's found that he's been welcomed into since coming back. Right. And then we get um, Simon, Simon returning to Rorton. Um, we get to Simon returning to Rorton, finally, because he's been gone this entire time. All of this shit's been happening, and Simon's just been having a meltdown in a hotel room. And so he comes back home, and he's been given this leather kit to kill the like first whole, risen. Like a whole, like, and kit. I mean, he could just shoot him in the head. That feels like the, wouldn't you want to kill the first risen in the least... The well, least painful way possible? Is that really going to involve a set of pliers? This is a torture kit. What the fuck? Well, th this is like a, or even like a field surgery kit. This is like slicing a body open, yeah. cutting bones, snipping tendons. Wh what? Right. And you'd do that if you were like skinning an animal in the field. And if you need him to die at a precise moment, are you going to go the long way around? Or are you just going to shoot him in the head? Right. Why? Well, why? Why all of this? All the tools. Why the... The dramatic. I was expecting a gun wrapped yeah. up, like a maybe a deep... or maybe just like a ritualistic blade. Yeah, well, even then, I mean, come on, right? I don't know. We'll find out, I guess, because we're about to watch the finale. I'm excited, and I think we should just go do that right now. Let's go do it. Okay. Uh, go ahead. You do your thing. Sometimes. The strangest things are the most beautiful, too. So be who you are and love what you love. Until next time, friends. Bye. See you soon. Oh, yeah. See you soon. Bye.